I will also tell you that um, for the second year in a row, uh, my audio failed when I was recording in lecture one. Um, and my audio is going to be terrible today. But my replacement microphone is getting delivered by Amazon this afternoon. <laughs> so it will be better in the future. If you are listening to this after the fact, I'm sorry, it sounds bad. Okay, so our goal today is to start thinking about how we make sense of this whole interconnected network of things that are part of the immune system. If you think about other physiologic systems, say the nervous system, there is kind of this one spotlight organ, the brain. And you can think of also other important parts. You think of the cardiovascular system. You think of the heart right away. Um, when you think of the immune system, it gets harder to think of what is the organ. Um, and as you'll see today, we can sort of talk about why that is and what some of the ideas are. But we have this really interconnected system with a lot of different parts. And so in order to make sense of it, we like to use different sort of classification schemes to divide up the immune system and to help us describe different aspects of the system. One of the ways that we divide up the immune system is into a set of layers. Um, so we often talk about the immune system as having three different layers. One, the barrier defenses. One, the innate immune system layer. And one, the adaptive immune system layer. Um, and so as we talk about different aspects of the immune system, we can classify them into one of these different layers. Um, sometimes people also talk about something called the intrinsic um, immune uh, layer. Um, I'm not going to say a ton about that. Um, and the real reason is because these three layers are a little bit artificial in us deciding we're going to call this part barrier and this part innate and this part adaptive. Um, the things that some people call intrinsic, I feel, are sort of straddling the line in some different parts. And so I cover them in a different, in a different way, not as something separate. Um, if you have previously learned about the acquired immune system, um, that is actually what I am referencing here as the adaptive immune system. Uh, the acquired immune system term um, really stopped being used by immunologists around 2000. But sometimes people in other parts of biology still put it when they're describing their immune system in their textbooks. So you will not hear the word acquired for me. The, the word acquired immunity kind of makes me a little twitchy. Um, one time Dunaway said it in something and it was funny. Um, but, uh, so, so we're going to think about this in terms of barrier innate and adaptive. I'm going to tell you a little bit about barrier defenses today. I'm going to tell you a little bit about them um, another uh, day coming up. Um, but immunologists often don't really think about this layer of barrier defenses. Uh, and people often forget about the, the barrier defenses as part of the immune system. Um, yet, they are incredibly important defenses. Um, one of the things that is becoming kind of new and hot in the field is thinking about barrier immunity. And in some ways, it's like, yeah, guys, we probably should have been doing that all along. But that's OK. Um, the biggest organ of the barrier defenses is the skin. Basically, you have this nice layer that protects you, in this case, in many cases, protects you from infection. It keeps the microbes out. So they can't infect you in the first place to start the disease. There are some other parts of your body that have to be in contact with microbes um, because they have to be in contact with the outside world, like the respiratory tract, the GI tract. And many of them have special adaptations to help reduce infection and be a barrier to infection. 
So there are things like the acidity of the stomach or the cilia in your lungs that are sweeping uh, microbes out or things like that. And so all of these things are kind of broadly things that are part of the barrier defenses. Again, people often don't really think about this as being part of the immune system. Um, however, if you see people who have compromised barrier defenses, the most common way that you might see that is uh, thinking about burn victims who have compromises in their skin, the problem that they have is recurrent infection because they don't have a barrier to uh, microbial colonization. So the barrier is important, but by and large, when we think about the immune system, we tend to spend most of our time as immunologists thinking about either innate or adaptive immunity. And so we're, I'm going to give you kind of broad strokes definitions of innate and adaptive immunity um, so that we can then apply other stuff to those broad definitions, though we will then be spending much of the semester <laughs> thinking about innate versus adaptive immunity. Um, there are some common defining characteristics of the innate versus the adaptive immune response. They are shown from your textbook here. Um, one of the big differences that we see between innate and adaptive immunity is the timing of their response following microbial exposure. The innate immune system is responding within hours of that microbe coming into the body. Usually, I think of the innate immune response as being the response that's happening within, say, the first 96 hours. Alternatively, the adaptive immune response is going to be much slower. Um, it is a response that um, often is not going to really be appreciable or measurable for about a week. It might be max at 10 days or two weeks. Um, so it is slow. The innate immune response is fast. What I hope that you might realize in looking at that is that's actually a pretty important thing if you recall what I told you about growth rates on Monday. If you had to wait 10 days before responding to any microbe, that microbe would win every time um, because of how quickly microbes reproduce. So having something that's responding in the first 96 hours is pretty important. However, when I was in graduate school, when I took immunology as an undergraduate, um, actually when I was in graduate school um, as TAs, we each had to write up things about certain sections of the course and um, the innate immunity stuff was kind of a running joke among us as TAs as the thing with the short straw. Like, no one wanted to deal with that. No one wanted to think about that. That was the lame thing, the adaptive immune response. Cool. Um, and there are a lot of reasons why people think about the adaptive immune response as being really important. If I went through our class schedule and circled, is this more related to adaptive or innate immunity, you would see the majority of what we're going to talk about this semester is going to be adaptive. Um, because of all of these other properties of adaptive immunity, but I hope you also can see here that with the time issue, if innate immunity didn't exist, even though we as grad students back in the day were all like, oh, that's a lame one, um, we would not exist. So we should not underestimate it. Um, and I'll even show you another uh, piece of information about that. I'll actually switch the order of some things up and show you that right now. Um, also, um, if people didn't notice, the slides are posted, though I'm going in about things in a slightly different order. Um, so this is um, an example of kind of a general idea of what might happen with an infection in an individual. So first we can look at the yellow line where we're seeing the amount of, pick your favorite pathogen, 
um, over time. And this is kind of what it should look like after infection. The microbe should start out at zero because you weren't infected with it. Then you get infected and the microbe starts to grow in you and reproduce. Eventually, it kind of gets to some peak level and gets stuffed in its tracks, no more increase. And then finally, we decrease and we reduce that number of, um, and, or of microbes. There are patients who have been described, there are some very famous patients in the uh, liter immunology literature who have genetic mutations that mean, that mean that they actually have no adaptive immune response at all. So there are some mutations that give you zero adaptive immune response. And those patients, um, particularly in the past, really did have a lot of issues. I would say most of them did not make it past age 20. Um, and they had a lot of issues with infections. Um, we now have, a, have some pretty good treatments. So. Uh, now they can uh, be uh, pretty healthy. But what you can see is that in those individuals who are in the green line, microbes are able to reproduce and they sort of reproduce, but they don't go reproduce exponentially in forever, indefinitely. They do eventually get stopped in terms of their increase, but they never get cleared in those individuals. Those individuals might have those microbes reproducing in their body forever instead of actually having the immune system get rid of them. If we think about what would happen without the innate immune system, we can hypothesize that we would see what is shown here in the red line, which is that the microbes increase exponentially. In fact, they increase even faster than they normally do because normally the immune system was doing something here to slow them down a little bit they just increase out of control exponentially really quickly. And this is only a hypothesis because we have never found a person who does not have, who has a complete lack of an innate immune response. In fact, we really haven't found an organism that has a complete lack of an innate immune response. Having a complete lack of an innate immune response is incompatible with life as far as we can understand. So as much as we are going to think a lot about adaptive immunity and people, adaptive immunity is the big flashy one um, that many immunologists think about. Um, you can't be alive without the innate immune system. So even though I'm going to tell you here about some cool properties of adaptive immunity, don't undersell the innate immune system. Um, so the next big difference between these two responses um, is sort of hinted at in both of these um, next two boxes. It's always really weird to describe to people who don't yet know immunology. And so that's why they, people always describe these things in the weirdest terms. So I'm just going to try to tell you what is going on with these boxes. Um, so the idea with um, the third one down is a little bit easier. With innate immunity, um, we have a relatively small number of things that can be recognized, a small number of receptors. Um, most of those receptors recognize things kind of broadly. So we do recognize a ton of pathogens. Um, sometimes I like to make up a guess, this is a totally made up number, that maybe we have, say, 100 innate immune receptors. And I totally made that number up. Alternatively, with the adaptive immune response, we have about um, a quadrillion different receptors. Um, so it's this massive number of receptors allowing us to have really, really good specificity. Um, if you looked at the news earlier today, this is an argument for a later time, but there was discussion of, uh, in fact, the FDA approved um, Omicron-specific boosters today. Um, the way that those 
would change the immune response would be in changing this nice selective adaptive response. The innate response is exactly the same. The adaptive response is so specific. That's where we're seeing the difference between this year's flu and last year's flu, and Omicron and Delta, or whatever have you. Well, the innate response is gonna be much more limited. It might respond to virus. Um, for some reason, immunologists love the phrase, the exquisite specificity of the adaptive immune system, because we have such great specificity. It's really, really specific. And there's a huge number of uh, potential receptors. With the innate, so this one is the one that's always real tricky to, to phrase until you know what you're talking, you're talking about. Later on, you're gonna come back to this and be like, oh yeah, of course. Right now, that's gobbledygook. With the innate immune response, basically, you have some limitations in how much variation you can have. And the receptors that we have are normal old receptors. In the adaptive immune system, there are some unique genetic processes that allow us to get more variability in the receptors. So, um, sometimes people will talk about this in a bunch of different ways. Sometimes people talk about germline receptors versus variable receptors. Until you know what the heck germline receptor versus variable means, that doesn't help you any more than this. The moral of the story is normal receptors versus fun genetics. Um, the other big difference is that when you are making an innate immune response, that response um, is constant while your adaptive response will improve or change over the course of the response. So to give you a general idea of this, again, this is something that can be, we can talk about in much more detail later on. Here you can see what might happen when you are exposed to a particular microbe. The lighter blue color shows you the magnitude, so there's the general size, of the innate immune response over time. The darker blue is the adaptive immune response over time. So you can see the innate immune response has this pro of making a response pretty early, where the adaptive response is a little bit later. But then when the adaptive response finally does decide to show up, you have this pretty nice um, response that's gonna help you out a lot. However, Later on, if you get infected again with this same thing, your innate immune response is going to look exactly the same as it did before, while your adaptive immune response will look different. It will have, in fact, adapted. How it got the name. Um, and so you'll see both, it's actually a change both in quantity and quality of the response um, with adaptive immune. Um, and in fact, even if you were to look at the response throughout this time, even though you're getting both the change in quantity and quality as well. So that response is improving over time. The innate immune response is basically always um, the same. And one sort of key reason why this can happen, again, this is this slide is going to look like sort of not that important and why is she telling us this and if you come back and review these slides say right before exam one or right before exam two you're going to look at this slide and be like oh yes this is so important because it's actually like a key principle of the whole field it's just now you don't totally know what the importance do you have a question yeah okay. um for adaptive you mm -hmm. said that it might have shown the bigger peak because in adaptive mm -hmm. you would be So great question. Um, one of the reasons is actually this. So perfect question. Um, so a general way that the adaptive immune response works is that we make a huge diversity of adaptive immune cells. Here they're shown as different because of different colors. They also have different shaped receptors. So when you start out a response, you have 
one yellow cell. When the yellow cell binds to its particular uh, microbe, we basically are saying to it, you're good, you did a good job, we need more of you, you're important. And so that cell divides a lot um, and expands. So we have selection of a clone, the clonal selection theory. So now instead of having one, you have many of those cells. And that's a big way that we get that improvement is that we go from having one cell that has the knowledge to fight the microbe to having many cells that have the knowledge to fight the microbe. Does that help to address your question? Um, and so the, this idea of clonal selection is a key part of how the adaptive immune response works. Um, there are other ways that as immunologists, we can divide up the immune system. One of the early ways that some immunologists tried to divide up the immune system um, is one that you might see referenced in books or things. I actually kind of despise this distinction, but um, because, and the reason why I despise it is because it confused me so much as a student. Now I'm like, okay, I get what you mean. But at the time as a student, I was like, but no. Um, so I don't love it, that's okay. But sometimes we think about cells that do stuff, important. And we often call that cellular immunity because the cell is doing a thing. Other immunologists care a lot more about the liquid of the blood, which really contains proteins. And so they think about the humors. Like the ancient Greeks taught about the humors and they called it humoral immunity because it's, it's the liquid blood stuff. I used to get super confused about that because guess what? Those proteins in the humors came from cells. So I was like, this is dumb, They're all, it's all cells, what are you doing? Um, but often we can talk about whether the cell has the key role or the protein has a key role. I mention this because um, starting on Friday, we're going to go into more detail about the innate immune system. On Friday, we're going to talk about innate immune, the innate immune response in terms of humoral responses or proteins. The next week, we'll do innate immunity in terms of cells or cellular responses. So there are times when this distinction can be useful. Um, don't get too hung up on it. But what I also want you to see is that this is kind of, you can see we're sort of starting to take that mass of all those different things that are part of the immune response and divide it up to try to help us make sense of it. The other big thing that we can do is we can look at the different kinds of cells of the immune system and try to divide them up. And so um, for the next while of this class today, we're gonna talk about the types of blood cells and sort of divide them up. What we would find in terms of cells in the blood. Um, if you actually look at blood under a microscope, this is the list of cells that you might potentially see. Tomorrow in lab, you are going to look at blood under a microscope, and this is exactly <laughs> what you are going to see. Um, so you can see that blood contains red blood cells or erythrocytes, as well as white blood cells um, and some platelets. Immunologists are generally focused on the white blood cells. And another word for white blood cell is leukocyte. We can divide up the leukocytes into different types. I want to point out that one kind of leukocyte is called a lymphocyte. I'm going to be going through each of these types um, as we go today. But I, just to start out, Leukocyte is all the white blood cells. One kind is lymphocyte. Sometimes students want to switch those two terms or use those two terms interchangeably, and they're not interchangeable terms. Leukocyte is 
all white blood cells. Lymphocyte is a specific kind of white blood cell. Um, if we think about these cells, they differ from one another in many ways. So one way they differ from one another is in how long those cells can live. So you can see that we've got sort of a short number of days up to years. Um, there are some specific types of lymphocytes that I have seen uh, in papers that have been thought to live up to 75 years versus we've got you know some cells here that are six hours, five days. So we've got big ranges in how long these cells are gonna live. Um, just zooming in on this table, we also have big differences in how many cells you have per milliliter of blood of these different types. So notice with the red blood cells, this number is times 10 to the sixth. When we actually get into all of these white blood cells, which are starting here, you see we're at 10 to the third or 10 to the two. So there's a big difference in how many of them we see in the blood. Kind of makes sense. Blood is red, not white. Um, you might say, well, you told us earlier that um, there wasn't really an a organ for the immune system. Um, and you might say, well, but I think it might be the blood. Okay, cool. Just realize that immunologists pretty rarely think about red blood cells. So um, we're, if we just think of the white blood cells, it's about like 0.1%. So it's kind of hard to say this is our organ, except we only care about 0.1% of it. Um, so um, you can see that there's a bunch of variation. I have this slide and this slide here, they may help you in lab tomorrow if you want to look at them for reference. Both of those are going to be pieces of information that are going to be useful. All of the cell types shown here, the red blood cells, the platelets, all of the other cells of the blood have in common that they are known as hematopo hematopoietic cells. What that means is that they come from this process called hematopoiesis. Um, they all come from the same original stem cell. So there's this one kind of original stem cell, the hematopoietic stem cell, that can develop along different paths to eventually make every other cell in the blood. Um, those hematopoietic stem cells are found in your bone marrow, traditionally, uh, as part of a bone marrow transplant. So one of the reasons why, even though we are going to talk about red blood cells this much in the class, technically, they do come from the hematopoietic stem cell. They are related to all of our other cell types, even if we're not going to think about sort of this piece uh, very much. Um, hematopoiesis. Um, so it has two Greek roots that it comes from. Um, hema, that's blood, not a chakra. Poesis is actually Greek to make, and it is the same root word for poesis. Um, I say that because immunologists, first of all, love to call things something poesis. So if you make lymphocytes, it's lymphopoesis. If you make myelocells, it's myelopoesis. And they also really like to write papers about the poetry of blood cells. And like the first time I heard that pun, it was funny. But now I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, you're, you're good. We're, we're good. <laughs> um, this is from a earlier version of your textbook. Your current version of your textbook looks at this slightly differently. Um, because what the current version of your textbook does is it highlights the fact that there are these two major branches that can be made from the hematopoietic stem cell. You can see one of those branches here. So there's that same stem cell, it's still brown. It could do a branch that is not shown here or the branch that is shown here 
quite well. And this particular branch um, leads to the red blood cells that we're not going to think much about and some of our white blood cells. Those white blood cells are in fact known as the myeloid cells. You can see they come from the myeloid progenitor. And the thing that is important about the myeloid cells is that myeloid cells all are part of the innate immune system. The cells that are going to develop along this other branch are going to be part of the adaptive immune system. So this is kind of one place where our divisions meet up well. If we look among the myeloid cells, there are these two particularly big branches that are shown here. One of those types of cells are known as the granulocytes. On this slide and all of the rest of the slides I show you today that have um, some of these cells of the immune system, you will see cells with this type of staining from microscopy images on the slide. That is a very classic staining that is uh, called a right stain that is used to identify blood cells. Um, it's so common that people do things like make necklaces of characteristic white blood cells or earrings. Um, and it's what we're going to be looking at tomorrow. Um, and these cells were named granulocytes because when you look at them with the uh, right stain, they have granules. That one is hard. The granules aren't always as obvious in this one. Um, but um, by eye, but through some other methods, there are definitely a lot of granules there. So one type of cell that we're going to see here are these innate immune cells with granules. There are three kinds of granulocytes, neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils. Neutrophils are the earrings today. Part of lab tomorrow is going to be identifying these. So while this may seem like, oh my gosh, all these words, tomorrow, by the end of lab tomorrow, you're going to be totally good with this. Um, they're different colors based on different components of the granules. Um, which we'll talk about. When we think about our granulocytes, our neutrophils, our eosinophils, and our basophils, one place where they will vary a lot is in how frequent they are in the blood. So if we look at all of the white blood cells, you can see that the vast majority of them are neutrophils. Um, then there are a, a pretty small number of eosinophils and a very small number of basophils. This also actually impacts how much we know about these cells and their functions. Basophils are really hard to work with because they're so few in the blood. Um, tomorrow, when you are looking for cells, you may have trouble finding a basophil. You may not find a basophil. And I will probably say, that's good, because that means your donor got to keep their one basophil instead of you know, putting it on a slide. So it's OK. So you can see there are big differences. And most of the time when people are thinking granulocytes, they mean neutrophils, just because there are so many neutrophils. If you have gone to your doctor to have a complete blood count or CBC done, um, to do, uh, they will be looking at the numbers of your white blood cells, and they will be basically trying to see how many white blood cells you have and how they compare to these percentages. You might have heard of having an elevated white count, it means that you know you're sick. Um, that actually just means you have too many neutrophils um, in the blood, because neutrophils like to hang out in other places, like the bone marrow, and get released when you're sick. Um, so changes in some of these numbers. Um, might be an indication of uh, things being awry. If you look at these cells, and this is something we'll see a lot of tomorrow, um, you'll see that they're all pretty round. That's actually important. If they were not round and they tried to flow through the blood, they would get torn in half. Um, 
some of these cells have relatives that live in tissues outside the blood. Um, and so you're probably not gonna see them in lab tomorrow because we're looking at blood. But there are some other related cells and the big cell type that is related to a granulocyte that is not generally found in the blood is a mast cell. Um, so here you can see a mast cell. They are closely related to other granulocytes. They are granular, as you can see here, but they are generally not in the blood. They're mostly in the tissues. Um, here you can see a really cool electron micrograph of a mast cell um, before it gets triggered. And you can see that mast cell after it gets triggered where basically it shoots its granules at things like little bombs. Um, and you can also see that this has some you know, delicate stuff on the outside that wouldn't make it well in the blood. Um, if we think about our major types of myeloid cells, um, we can get to another branch as well. So we just saw the granulocytes. You can see they are one of these branches of the myeloid cells. They're all pretty closely related to each other. This puts the mast cell over there. I kept my own mast cell. Um, but then there's this other branch here um, that is also myeloid cells. They're also cells of the innate immune system. Um, and these cells are known as monocytes. Um, so you can see a monocyte here. Monocytes can become cells called macrophages. The macrophages often are in tissues. I am largely this semester going to say monocytes and macrophages are the same thing. Officially they're not, but for our purposes they're going to be. Um, and so you can see them here as well. Um, they're very characteristic under a scope. Necklace is a monocyte, okay, necklace is a macrophage, and this is what I work on in my lab. Um, and you can see that those monocytes are kind of a smaller percentage of the total leukocytes. So they are less frequent than the total leukocytes. The specific functions of neutrophils and monocytes are things that we are going to focus on on next week. I don't know which day. <laughs> um, eosinophils and basophils, you can see um, sort of do some things with response to parasites. We'll get to them much later in the semester. Also, there's like four of them. Um, so there, it's harder to talk a lot about what they're, work, what they're doing. Um, just like with um, our granulocytes, um, when we think about the uh, monocyte uh, macrophage group, there are some related cells that are not found in the blood and that are instead found in tissues. Um, so you probably will not see them tomorrow. Um, one of them is known as the dendritic cell. Um, that is a terrible image of a dendritic cell. But I have a poster that I put in the front of the room during tomorrow's lab that has some really pretty dendritic cells. So if you want to see a pretty one, you can look at the poster instead of this ugly one. Um, these cells have little projections like dendrites and they tend to be found in tissues. They're 100% myeloid cells. They're 100% part of the innate immune system, but their job is actually to turn on the adaptive immune system. So they kind of sit on the border a little bit between the two, although they are innate immune cells, 100%. Alternatively, we can also think about this other branch of white blood cells that can develop, which are the lymphoid cells. Um, the lymphoid cells are the cells of the adaptive immune system, as opposed to the myeloid cells, these ones that came from this other branch that were the cells of the innate immune system. When you are looking at cells under a mi the microscope tomorrow, all of the lymphoid cells are really going to be clumped together. Not like physically clumped together, but you're gonna call them all just lymphocyte. <laughs> You're not, you're not gonna call them different kinds of cells, even though there actually are a, a bunch of different types. So you're basically gonna say, it's lymphoid. You're not gonna be able to tell me which of all these different types there are. Um, so we have a, a bunch of cells we're just gonna call lymphocytes. 
at the moment. Um, the big thing about the lymphocyte is this nice big circular nucleus with a little bit of cytoplasm around it. They can look a little bit different from time to time, but they um, are largely going to kind of look like this tomorrow. Um, and usually when we think about lymphoid cells, when we think about lymphocytes, we are talking about cells of the adaptive immune system. Much later in the semester, we're going to talk a little bit about a specific type of cell called a natural killer cell. And natural killer cells are annoying because they don't like, they don't understand textbooks and that they have to pick a chapter. <laughs> and they have to pick if they are innate or adaptive because in some ways they got some, a little bit of both. So that's why I have stars up here. Lim the, all the rest of the lymphocytes, particularly T cells and T cells and B cells, they're adaptive immune cells. And K cells do not behave. Um, and the more we learn, the more we actually have realized there's a whole class of new cells that sort of don't behave, um, the ILCs. And so we'll talk about them a little bit more later. When I say lymphocyte or when I say lymphoid cell, I mean adaptive immune cells. But for full transparency and honesty, there are some obnoxious cells that don't like to behave like this. They do not want to be contained to one chapter. Um, when we look at lymphocytes, you can see they're sort of uh, second most common in the blood after neutrophils. What you should also notice looking at this is that the ranges that are listed for most of these cell types are pretty huge. Um, you know, you could imagine if I want to look at your blood and I want to say, are you healthy or not? Are you healthier with 41 versus 74 percent neutrophils? Maybe for you, 41 is health, and for somebody else, 74 is health. Um, this is a place where immunologists sort of have some work to do in some definitions. I point this out because some students are going to get um, you know, worried tomorrow when they look at their blood smears that they have different percentages than somebody else. There's a broad range that is an okay percentage for all of these things. Don't get stressed about that. Um, yes? Um, can you mention that, um, like, a, like a doctor takes a look at your white blood cells mm -hmm. and from there tries to determine if a patient is sick or not? Mm -hmm. um, is it, so would they be sick if they have less or way more? So usually the thing that, we're lo that they're looking for when they do that is too many um, with the idea that neutrophils have come out of the bone marrow, so you have extras. Um, but to be honest, different changes could be indicative of different diseases. Um, but if you, if you go to the doctor for a CBC to have your white blood cell count checked, the first thing they're really looking at is do you have too many um, because that would be in, might be indicative of um, ongoing infection. But as you will see tomorrow, in fact, we're going to look at some disease states. Um, there are other disease states that you can also um, detect uh, by using this. All right, so here we've seen the cells, the who's who, but we also need to think a little bit about the where's um, for the immune system. So we need to think about specific organs. Um, the organs of the immune system is another place where um, I, as an immunologist, can take credit for pretty much every organ. Um, if I want an organ, I can make it an immune organ. Honestly, if I want a cell, I can make it an immune cell too. Um, but we've got a bunch of different organs that we can think about as organs of the immune system. And again, we can sort of divide them up in a few different ways. So we, we have some classification systems here, just like we did for the cells. Um, so you've got a bunch of organs shown here um, and labeled. You also can notice that they are shown in different colors in some cases. Two of them are shown in red. And those two are the primary lymphoid organs. You have two primary lymphoid organs. They are the thymus and the bone marrow. And you can see some 
details of the thymus and the bone marrow here. Primary lymphoid organs are pretty easy in terms of defining what they do. Primary lymphoid organs are where leukocytes develop. Um, so in some ways you can think about them as the sites of hematopoiesis, but officially they're defined as where leukocytes develop. And there's only two choices in adults. Um, in fetuses, it's slightly different. Again, problem for another time. In adults, thymus, bone marrow. Um, you are doing leukocyte, you are generating new leukocytes all day, every day throughout your life. You currently are making new leukocytes in your primary lymphoid organs. Um, you will hear many times throughout the semester, I will mention things that you are currently doing right now um, in terms of immune responses. And I love them because my poor mother, my sister and I both have PhDs in immunology, and are both immunologists. And she'll be like, what are you doing? You're sitting on the couch doing nothing. And I'll be like, mom, I'm doing hematopoiesis. What are you talking about? Um, except my poor mother has to put up with the two of us. Um, so you are, all, in your primary lymphoid organs, you are making white blood cells all the time. Um, we also have secondary lymphoid organs. The secondary lymphoid organs are shown in this slide uh, in yellow. And these include things like the spleen, as well as the lymph nodes, which are kind of the stars. Um, those two, spleen and lymph nodes, are stars of secondary lymphoid organs. You can also see that there are a number of others. And to fully explain um, secondary lymphoid organs and kind of what's going on with these secondary lymphoid organs, I have to tell you a couple of things about some other aspects of um, anatomy and physiology with the circulatory system. So I'm going to give you the immunologist view of the circulatory system. Whoever has taken anatomy and physiology, I apologize in advance for some of my oversimplifications. There are just a couple points you got to get uh, from this. So this is kind of all well, we really need to know about the circulatory system. So <laughs> As far as I mean, all this are concerned, sometimes I draw a little heart here. Um, and what I want you to think about with the circulatory system is that we have the heart, a very large, very strong pump that pushes liquid, that is going to push liquid through this series of vessels. We're going to start with the aorta, which you can see is big. It's a big tube. <laughs> And then you can see we go into arteries and arterioles, and then into capillaries, and you can see that we're getting into smaller and smaller diameter vessels or tubes. You can see here the diameter, you know, details about area. Um, but you can also think about this in terms of pressures. And you actually totally understand this right now. You just don't know that you understand this. So I want you to imagine that you have liquid flowing at a high rate. Maybe it's coming out of a fire extinguisher. Maybe it's coming out of the hose in your backyard. Whatever kind of fast flowing liquid with a tube you want to think of, imagine right now, okay? Now, what happens if you take the fire hose, the hose, whatever, and you squeeze it and decrease the diameter. What will actually happen? If I, if I had a whole bunch of water, so at, someday I'm gonna do this where I have a whole bunch of water and straws, and we can do a live demo. But if I, made, if I squeeze the straw, squeeze the hose, squeeze whatever, what's gonna happen? Yeah? Pressure builds up. Pressure builds up, so then what? Yeah? And then uh, everything gets backed up and it gets uh, all so maybe everything gets backed up. Maybe everything expands. Anything else that could happen? Yeah. Could they simply burst out? It could burst. It could blow up, right? Based on what I'm showing you here, this shouldn't work. You should actually be getting such increases in pressure as we get smaller and smaller vessels. You should explode. You should not exist. 
if you look around, you'll notice no one has exploded today. So clearly there's something else going on here to deal with this pressure issue. And that is in fact true. When we think about the arteries and the arterioles, their walls are permeable to liquid. And so liquid can actually be forced out of the arteries and arterioles to reduce the pressure. Some people may have heard of interstitial fluid. This is interstitial fluid, really. So basically, we push the liquid out to decrease pressure. When I was originally taught about capillaries in high school bio, we always learned they're so small. One cell at a time, you can go through. Part of it's because we already pushed all the water out, so there only is the one cell at a time to go through um, to get rid of that pressure. So basically, we take the water of the blood and we push it out to maintain pressure balance. That's cool, but it gives us another problem. If again, if it just worked like this, like I've explained, we have another issue. Worked like that, you are Jabba the Hutt. You are just a big blob of liquid that has seeped out of your uh, vessels. And so we have this stuff, this interstitial fluid, and we have to collect it back so we don't just become a big blob. And evolution has been very clever about this. There are a bunch of different vessels throughout the body that are open-ended vessels to collect that liquid or that water so that it doesn't build up anywhere. Those are known as the lymphatic vessels. They're just these open-ended vessels for collecting that water. There is no pump on this system, but there are valves throughout these vessels so liquid can only flow in one direction. The way that you actually force liquid to go into any of these open vessels and start the process, then you know, once it's in, it can only go one direction because the vessels or the valves only let it go one direction. But the way you force the liquid in is by body movement. Um, and evolution has been clever because at different places throughout this system, we've evolved little organs to do surveillance. Because basically, we're picking up all the material from all over the body that could be in this liquid, in this water that we pushed out. We basically bathe the cells in this liquid, pretty good for nutrients as well. And if there were microbes around, they're going to end up in this liquid too. And then when we collect it back and try to bring it back into the circulatory system, we check it to see if there are microbes. And so at different places along these lymphatics, we have lymph nodes which are really just these immune surveillance organs that are trying to check things. And so what you can see here from your textbook are these open-ended lymphatic vessels in different parts of the body. Here, we're looking at, I guess, I think this is supposed to be skin. Um, maybe there are some bacteria that get in to a particular wound. And those will get picked up along with the fluid as you're moving around and will flow into the lymph node where we can actually start to do surveillance. That's really what um, is going on with the secondary lymphoid organs. You have lymph nodes throughout your entire body. This slide is from a textbook that is uh, a little bit out of date, and it shows the lymph nodes actually stopping up here. Um, we actually now know there are lymph nodes going throughout. Um, if any of you guys have taken cell molecular neuro with Professor Knowles, he does, you guys do a dissection um, of the brain and you get rid of this trash, the meninges. The meninges is full of lymph nodes. Um, and so you have these little lymph nodes or surveillance systems throughout the body. Each of them will drain a particular area and sort of be providing surveillance for that area. So for example, the lymph node behind the knee is doing surveillance for the bottom half of your leg. The lymph node in the groin is doing surveillance for the top half of your leg. 
the lymph nodes here are doing surveillance for your sinuses, um, and on and on. And so we have our blood coming from the heart as well as our white blood cells. Um, and eventually, everything's going to end up in the lymph node. The lymph, that, li that liquid, that water, is going to be in the lymph node. And we're going to carry it back to the heart, dump it into the heart, um, and keep that water so that we aren't Jabba the Hutt. And so you can see um, the blood is going to flow, but we're going to pick up all that liquid back into the lymph and dump it back into the heart. Um, and any particular microbes in an in a area will be drained into the local lymphatic, and we can start that um, response there. So these lymphatics, these secondary lymphoid organs, are the places where we are getting the draining uh, and where we're actually doing that surveillance of microbes. And in a lot of ways, we think about those secondary lymphoid organs as being the places where immune cells meet microbes for the first time. They're the places where the party happens. Um, and so they are kind of particularly important um, immune uh, organs, but you can see they're kind of spread everywhere. It's not like there's the one organ. Um, so um, this also makes uh, for a lot of efficiency in the immune system. Imagine that I told you, I already did tell you, you don't really have to imagine it. Um, we have these lymphocytes that are super, super, super specific because they're part of the adaptive immune system. They respond to, you know, this lymphocyte responds to um, the Omicron variant of SARS-CoV-2. You don't want that lymphocyte, you have one. You don't want that lymphocyte to have to go through your body to go to the first cell. Do you have SARS-CoV-2? And that's the cell here. Thank you. And go through every cell of your whole body from the top of your head to the bottom of your toe. That would take a really long time. And you can imagine the virus could do it off a lot back there while I'm checking my things out up here, right? So the cells don't try to check out every single cell individually. They just hit the lymph nodes. In this quadrant, is there something? 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 It picks you up a lot of efficiency as well to set up a system this way. Specifically, as I've kind of been alluding to, our lymph nodes are our main secondary lymphoid organs. Um, in lab two, um, I'm actually gonna be showing you some immune organs in a mouse, um, and we're going to I'm actually uh, dissect them out of the mouse and get cells. Um, I will show you the lymph node. The lymph nodes are really tiny and hard to actually isolate, um, but I'll show you them. Um, in cross-section, they do have um, a lot of specific structures, a lot of specific subparts within them. Um, the other really important secondary lymphoid organ is the spleen, um, which you can see uh, here. Um, I will definitely show you the spleen of a mouse. Spleens are pretty big. I kind of think of a spleen as a really big lymph node. Um, it has a lot of the same parts um, as a lymph node, as well as this additional aspect called the red pulp, um, which has to do with red blood cells and filtering red blood cells. But it's a really big, really easy to obtain source of white blood cells. It's a really great secondary lymphoid organ. In my mind, in a lot of ways, I put the spleen and the lymph nodes as being pretty similar and somewhat interchangeable. There are also secondary lymphoid organs in other parts of the body. Um, so if we look carefully at other parts of the body, we can find other patches of secondary lymphoid tissue. So this is showing you some secondary lymphoid tissue um, in the gut. This is kind of a cartoon version. And here you can see some of that organized lymphoid tissue inside of the gut lumen. So here are some of the crypts. And then right under the crypts, we've got a little bit of secondary, a specialized lymphoid tissue. Um, so these are often found in some of those areas of the body that might be in contact with the outside world, the barrier organs. We have little special surveillance systems. Um, particularly, we see something called Peyer's patches on the GI tract. These are Peyer's patches on a mouse small intestine. 
Uh, I can show you those uh, in lab two as well. And sometimes we refer to this, the things that are shown here, as the GALT, which stands for the gastrointestinal associated lymphoid tissue. Because it's all in the gastrointestinal tract. You can find similar types of organized lymphoid tissue um, in other places as well, not just the GI tract. So you can find some of it in um, the nose. You can find some in terms of the adenoid. You can find some in terms of the tonsils. Um, and different people will refer to this as the malt, um, which, could, which is usually the mucosal lymphoid tissue. The bolt, the bronchialveolar <laughs> tissue, or the nolt, the nasal <laughs> lymphoid tissue. They're all basically some specialized mucosal site where we have little um, pockets of specialized lymphoid tissue to act as these types of surveillance systems. Finally, we have one additional type of organ. And these organs are known as the tertiary lymphoid organs. Um, I'm going to give you an example of a tertiary lymphoid organ. Or, sorry, I'm going to give you a definition. And then I'm going to ask you to name tertiary lymphoid organs based on my definition. So be ready. I have like a minute and a half left. And this is the last slide. So we got that. A tertiary lymphoid organ is a place where you are making an immune response a place where you are responding to an infection. So, what organs are examples of tertiary lymphoid organs? Can you name a tertiary lymphoid organ? Yes, Michael. The skin. Skin, okay. Anything else? Could it just be any organ? The answer is it's all of the organs. <laughs> um, you could have an infection. You could make an immune response anywhere. And so anything can be a tertiary lymphoid tissue. If on a particular day you have a cut and you have an infection in your skin, that day the tertiary lymphoid organ is the skin. If on another day you have a kidney infection, the tertiary lymphoid organ is the kidney. If on another day you have a respiratory infection, the tertiary lymphoid organ is the lung. And so the tertiary lymphoid organ basically is whatever organ, could be anything, um, it's wherever um, that infection is and wherever that immune response needs to happen. Um, so I will see you guys tomorrow in lab um, where we are going to work on thinking about these cells. And on Friday, we're gonna start thinking in more detail about innate immune responses and the details of it. Tomorrow.